right. Good evening. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening, we'll be hearing from Mr. James Walker and Mr. Brett Frazier. Mr. James Walker, a former Army artillery officer and federal employee, is currently UiPath's evangelist and public sector CTO. He served as the deputy CIO and services portfolio manager at NASA's Shared Services Center and had key IT positions at DISA, the U.S. Missile Defense Agency, and Counter Drug Task Force in Key West. He holds a Chief Information Officer certification from the National Defense University and a graduate degree in telecommunications. Mr. Brett Frazier has over 20 years of experience working with RPA, Cognitive and AI Technologies. Mr. Frazier brings a wealth of knowledge on automation, best practices, lessons learned, and use cases across the public and private sectors. Mr. Walker and Mr. Frazier, welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. And without further ado, I will hand it over to you guys. Thank you so much, Hannah. Greatly appreciate it. And much appreciation towards the Institute of world politics for having Jim and myself here to talk today about RPA. I also want to give a special mention out there to Jerry Freudenberg, 91 years old, joining us today. Jerry, welcome. For the rest of you, we've got uh, quite the agenda. According to the invite, the presentation will cover the history of RPA and the federal government and look to the future of a fully automated enterprise. So today, I wanted to get you through Automation 101, public sector meets RPA, a couple of case studies that we'll be covering as far as what we've seen so far in the federal world. And then I'm gonna click play and walk you through a demo of automation actually automating something. And I'll talk over it and give you some fun facts along the way. Then we're gonna talk about how to get to that hyper automation state, what it takes. And then lastly, we'll wrap things up with a live Q and A. So again, without further ado, Let's talk about me, where I come from. I'm Brett Frazier, COO for Jolt Advantage Group. We're a 360 degree pure RPA provider. We partner exclusively with UiPath and we automate everything possible and guide our clients through that experience for automation. Uh, we were 2019 Innovation Partner of the Year. Of course, we help with every facet of automation not just getting you the right solution, but also lining up the right resources to support you for development, testing, hyper automation, COE delivery, or scoping what needs to be started with. Jim, do you wanna talk a little bit about UiPath? Yeah, thank you, Brett. So I'm Jim Walker. I live down in uh, Pensacola, Florida. So for the, those of you that I looked on the list, some of you are coming from the Middle East, some of you are coming from West Coast. So we're in time zones all over, welcome. Uh, you are just like we at UiPath. We are a global company, very small um, footprint, about 2,500 people, um, 7,000 enterprise type uh, customers right now, uh, more than 70 federal, state, local in the U.S. and, and across the globe, uh, 2,900 employees. We, we go up and down on that number, but it's a, an incredibly fun company. I've done 32 years in the federal government, about 10 of those as an Army artillery guy. And so to come out after you know, that amount of time in the big bureaucracies and be surrounded by millennials who have a completely different work ethic than you're used to, and to really be able to pick the pieces and the parts of that that you like, it's an amazing thing. But even as fun as that is for me, RPA, robotic process automation, AI, machine learning, all of the things around automation is real true passion for myself. And I know it is for Brett, we, we speak often together. Um, and really excited to be able to really show you today why we have this passion for it. And uh, we're gonna do that through a significant number of use cases from across the US. Absolutely. So let's dive in. Automation 101. As Jim mentioned, I'm extremely passionate about RPA, about AI, cognitive technologies, and the way to couple that together to build a solution. Uh, we talked about the generations, there's good stuff coming. If I look 10 years ago, UiPath was a blip. Now look at it. The best, the brightest, the biggest. And of course, work is becoming digital that UiPath can help with. So from an RPA automation perspective, 
you really got to talk about human labor versus the use of technologies to augment it. We're not replacing it. As the almost a thousand resources I've hired in the past 20 years can attest, RPA and technology create jobs, thereby uh, we can build bigger, better, faster. So uh, the share of task hours between the work that was done from 2018, just three to four years ago, uh, in 2022 to come, the shift is already on the way. But what's to happen in 10 years from now? That piece of pie will be much, much bigger. We've got to do a lot more to get ready for that. And technology is the solution there within the uh, gov space. So, Jim, I want to ask you to cover this one. From an RPA perspective, uh, we, we've already been through it. Both of us have been clients of automation. We've adopted it. We've deployed it. From your lessons learned, what's the best benefit that you've seen? Yeah, so, you know, the work that you want, when you're thinking just about RPA, the work that we're saying should be done by an RPA robot or robots is the work that nobody goes home and celebrates with their kids. Nobody goes home to their significant other and says, hey, I was really lucky today. I looked at about 17,000 lines on a spreadsheet and compared those with an invoice from purchase cards made by people who don't know how to use a purchase card correctly. You don't go home and celebrate that work, right? And what RPA is gonna free up is it's gonna free employees up to do higher valued work, right? Uh, when the US government published an, a memorandum called the OMB 1823, they said that they wanted to displace the low value work and replace it with higher value work. I didn't like the use of low value because that work is not low value if it's necessary, but it's boring, it's mundane, it's tedious. It's the stuff you don't go home and talk about. But if I can free somebody up in the middle of a COVID crisis that they can go out and help other people, if I can free up people at a Customs and Border Patrol um, activity that they're doing so they can spend more time with people, if I can help somebody that is doing some type of unemployment claim or a medical claim or any other kind of government service claim, and it's, they don't go to the, get that claim so they can fill out papers, they go for the service. And so, RPA is extremely proficient at taking that work off of your staff so that your staff can be moved up into your work chain, into the places where you can be thought of as a great government service provider and not the government bureaucracy of the news. True. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, what can it do? Right. This is this is simple uh, for me, at least. What it can do is drive efficiency, scalability, and reduce human error. How? By mimicking human tasks. Uh, we often think of the matrix. We often think of uh, robots themselves doing those works. But for us, these technologies uh, towards that AI vision are technologies that see, say, do, and learn. For us, RPA is the technology that does. If a human could perform a task like logging into an application or, or connecting to other disparate systems, copying, pasting, uh, sending emails, that's all done on a screen. That's all done through clicks. Same thing for RPA. We just plan it out. We plan it out extremely efficiently. We plan these processes to do these tasks 24 hours a day. I can only really put a good four hours in a focus, Jim, before I, I've got to leave. But there's two different ways to do it. The first is to allow a robot to live on the desktop and when you need it, uh, just like a, a nail gun. You want to be able to give the mechanic or, or, or the carpenter the tool to do it at scale really fast and do it expertly and consistently and perfect. Now, of course, he could just use a nail and a hammer, but he's slow one at a time. So attended bots are those that are that nail gun consistent and nonstop on demand, ready when you need them to be. You double click them and say, ready, set, go. And they go. They do exactly what they're programmed and configured to do, nothing more, nothing less. Now, if you need automation that works in the background, that's server-based, that you can schedule up based on an event, based on a time, based on a condition or an alert, that's unattended bots. 
Those are the ones that work 24 hours a day unsupervised. So quite powerful. If you think that humans on average, 40% of the time get it wrong, 60%, we're doing pretty good. Uh, and we can do maybe one to two things at once. These robots can help us build that scale. And then lastly, of course, with the mistakes that can be made with the only being able to work a, a good 10 to 12 hour day, scalability can be achieved this way as well. It's really just integrating those, but where? You know, where do we integrate those tasks? Everywhere. Not everything can be automated. You need to plan this out properly. Uh, don't wanna promise 100% automation everywhere. Start, that's the hardest part, just plain getting started. Settle to begin with, with a sampling of what can 30% automation do and move from there rapidly and accelerate to that hyper automation ideal that we're gonna walk you through here. So Jim, I've got some common back office use cases here. We talk about these a lot. We've seen many clients deploy these. One of the things that I wanted to mention in the IT stack is the possibility of cybersecurity assistant. Uh, the ability for automation to secure and encrypt data, to ensure compliance and measure against regulation, to prevent phishing attacks, to block ports, to handle users, to handle permissions. What rank are you? Well, thank you, Captain, Colonel, General. Here's the information you have available to you. Oh, I see, Seaman. Well, thank you so much, but go sit over there. Here's the data you're allowed to see. Combining it all together with one single pane of glass view for the thought leaders out there. Jim, what's your favorite use case on here? And why? Yeah, so the, the favorite use case I've got is really the fact that it can be used in all these use cases. And the reason I say that is if, you, if your agency or your company is an Oracle company, you can only use Oracle for those financial things. If your service now, you're a ticketing system and an ITSM system, but, but you're not going to be able to do some things on that system. If you're a word processor, you're primarily a word processor and you can show math on there, but you can't really. RPA allows you to take a blank slate and apply it to any problem you have. I, I love the phrase. So we at UiPath had a phrase or have a phrase that what, called automation first. And that is the idea that you always ask yourself when somebody gives you a task, how do we automate that first? Gardner came up with what I would say automation first equals. And they have a phrase that says what can and should be automated will be eventually. Yeah. And, and I, exactly. I mean, I just love that phrase to, that goes to the other side of our auto, automation first mentality that says, you know, I can take invoice processing and immediately grab for RPA those things that are highly repetitive, rules-based, and I can automate those. So that's something that can be. If I've got the money and the time and the staff, then it should be. And the question is, do I do it now or do it eventually? And when you apply that automation first to it, you're actually going to say, well, now that I've automated the repetitive mundane portion of that task, can I apply some other automation like chatbots, like AI or machine learning to that and automate more of it? So that eventually I have leaned it out to use uh, Lean Six Sigma terms. I've leaned it out to where the only thing left is the part that absolutely requires a human. And that's the part that a, that a person really wants to do anyway. You know, nobody's doing invoice processing so they can type in the entries all day long. Yeah. No, nobody's doing personnel administration just so they can type in a phone number at the same time in 17 different forms. They do personnel management to help manage personnel. And so, you know, it's incredible. And, and I also want to, to, to remind you, these are kind of typical back office type of things. I would say that the security on the far right is not, but think of the, a car insurance company today. They do a great commercial where they take a picture of a bumper where the kid just bumped into something and the insurance company automatically starts their claim. Well, what if you are on your mission side of your work, you're a defense organization 
How about using that very same thing for battlefield damage assessment? If you're an electrician and you're out inspecting parts, maybe a drone is in some remote area of your country with a camera and that the camera looks at it and assesses whether or not there's too much corrosion or not. That's not a pure RPA thing. That's an AI ML type of thing. But once the AI or ML has said, hey, this is, pipe is corroded, you need to do something with it. That's where RPA comes back in. So it's not just pure RPA anymore. It can be. There's millions of jobs out there that are repetitive rope things that can definitely be automated, but just put an RPA bottle in there. But when you think automation first and you adapt that uh, or adopt that idea from Gartner, you really start to ask, how do I take the virtual employees, almost like a human workforce, humans have a salary and skills, and we put the right collection of them into a room and work gets done. Well, I'm going to take the same collection of virtual employees, AI, ML, and all that, give it a salary, the cost of doing that work, the skill that those particular ones have. I'm going to put them together such that I get work done for me so that my human workforce can really focus on important things. And important things might be simply being able to get out of the office at 4 p.m. and go to your daughter's basketball game. The important thing may be to be in a meeting like this where you're spending an hour listening to a presentation and you're not typing on your other computer, you're not turning your camera off so that you can, you know, do some side work, you're really able to focus because you know that the hour you're spending is not wasted and it's also not going to backlog you when you get back to your desk. So Brett, long answer, I appreciate, but I love the fact that RPA can be applied across business, across government, and really produce great results for you. Fair enough. Jim, tell me, is my presentation full screen? It is. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick check there. So as we talk about RPA, what it is now, where has it been deployed? Public sector meeting in the RPA. Jim, you are the expert here. So wanted to get some insight as far as what we've seen, the challenges that we've surmounted, as well as some of the use cases of where government agencies have seen benefits from it. So some of the things you touched on right here are the actual initiative itself, getting it in place. We all are familiar with the bureaucracy of government work. Uh, many of us have chosen it as, a, as a, a lifetime passion. So we're noticing leading agencies, not just starting to leverage RPA, but becoming fully mature in the use of RPA to the level where citizen developers are capable and augmenting those efforts. So Jim, anything else you wanna add on this slide before I move back to you for challenges? Um, yeah, I would just give you a quick history. So um, about five years ago, I got introduced when I was at the NASA Shared Services Center to RPA. Uh, a shared services center, as many of you know, provides services at a supposedly lower rate to your organization, and that's why people want them. And so we were trying to figure out at the NASA Shared Services Center how to reduce our rate so that more money could be spent on NASA mission activities and not on the paperwork aspect. And so we put the first bot into production. And honestly, to us, it was just excitement because we were racing against the IRS and we wanted to be first and, and we were, but it, was, it wasn't much bigger than that. But we got a call from the army, um, the deputy um, assistant secretary of the army for financial information management systems uh, called and asked us to come up and talk to them. And we did, and that bloomed an, uh, an entire um, lineage, if you will, in the family tree of RPA now into the DOD. And Gerard Bredorick, who is the uh, chief financial officer currently at the General Services Administration, heard one of our NASA presentations. And uh, I'll tell you more about his story in a few minutes, but he then started a program that has blossomed into 1,200 government employees now that meet every month to try to figure out how to accelerate the adoption of RPA and other intelligent automations into the government. And so, it, you know, that was only, by the time we rolled ours out, it, we're only talking about three and a half years ago. And now there are more than, 
in our case at UiPath, more than 79 of deployments in the federal government, about 11 states. Uh, our competitors have some also. So I say there's about 100 RPA installments in the federal government. You know, if you know anything about government, three and a half years to get into 30, 40% of all government organizations is incredibly fast. And the reason why we're having these successes is that leading agencies were improving their services. You can see a lot of publications out there from magazines and, and, and writers where the agencies are interviewing because they are seeing success. They're not seeing that typical 33% failure of an IT project. On the flip side, they're seeing 50,000 hours of time saving. I want you to remember if you divide 50,000 by two or 2,000, that tells you that there are about 25,000 FTEs or full-time equivalent people of work that's been saved. And RPA is not replacing a single job that I know of in the last three and a half years. What it's done is it's taken task away from government employees so that they can add a new higher value task to their work portfolio. But ask yourself, if you save 10,000 hours, the equivalent of five people, what could you do in your job and your government office and wherever you work? What could you do with the equivalent of five people's time in a year? Because I would argue you could either get to some of the things that you should have been getting to all along, or you're going to get to those things that you always said, if we only had this, we could do that. And so this fear that you know, bots are coming to take our jobs, we are years and years and years from that kind of uh, area. But we are at a place where robots can work with our human workforce to really free us up to do things that we could be doing or should be doing that we've never been able to do because you just, at some point, you reach a dollar threshold for staff. Jim, when was NASA? What year was that? Yeah, that was uh, nine, uh, 2018, I think April or May of 2018. So and, three uh, years ago. Yeah, that's right. It was Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So what's to come in the next three years? Have we have we uh, fixed these challenges yet? Um, so the shifting workforce demographics, I mean, no, we haven't. I just read a report this morning from the Internal Revenue Service where they say a third of their workforce could walk out at any time, not in a bad way, but in a retirement way. Silver tsunami, right? Silver tsunami. And, and because they can walk out tomorrow, the agencies are saying to themselves, how do we automate part of Bob's task and part of Mary's task? And when Bob does retire, we could move Mary up. So there's actually promotion opportunity. And Mary won't do what she used to do, which was her job and Bob's job. She'll do the remnants of both because she'll have automation down below her supporting her. And, and that's an amazing opportunity. The, the increase for demand so on the COVID. So I'd like for you to really appreciate the government, for the most part, you know, for the large percentage of government, can't shut down because we've got COVID. That's not an option, right? I mean, a lot of companies and, and businesses had to shut down, but the government had to stay working. So as the, the, the normal workload in most government agencies is right at their capacity or a little bit below, so they have a backlog. COVID comes up and hits, and the government workforce is told, go home and work from home. Yeah. The backlog continued to pile up at that point. Now, they've gotten, of course, a lot better at teleworking, but that's still backlog. In addition to that, especially in the first March, April, May part of COVID, these employees were taking care of themselves and families such that they weren't necessarily able to give an eight-hour day, the backlog. So we worried about the curve of COVID. I would say the curve of work is less lethal, but extremely painful for those employees right now that are trying to do the million passport backlog at the U.S. State Department. Right? Uh, fluctuating reg regulations. My goodness, we're, we just changed over a month or so ago. Fluctuation is everywhere. You know, we're switching things and changing things. Budget constraints. At the end of the day, even if you think you are a big government person, you know we can't hire much more. If you're a small government person, 
bots really help you out because at least we could keep the workforce where it is. And that's a constant. So that's pretty good. And then during COVID, and I certainly don't know what all other countries experienced, but I felt bad for our state of New Jersey when their governor came out and said, any COBOL developers out there that are retired, could you please consider coming back to work? Folks, in 1993, I thought COBOL was on its way out when I was taking a class in it. So to find out you know, 30 years or more later that the whole state of New Jersey's system was running off of COBOL, you know, and so when you get these outdated technologies and they get pressure like they got during COVID, that's a problem. And RPA can help with those. Yeah. Jim, brush up. COBOL people in Jersey need you. Oh, need so obviously it's critical, right? Why? Tell us about the criticality for modernization. Yeah. I mean, think about it. You... Um, you want to do some big data migration and you've got a big government database that you've had for 40 years. And when you move the data over and it gets messed up, you in, impact somebody's retirement pension. You move a medical record incorrectly and suddenly, you know, they're at the hospital getting treated for something they never had. Or a doctor doesn't give them something because he thinks they're allergic to something because it's in their record. It's just the wrong person. Same Jim Walker name, just different Jim Walker. Right. And so I'm able to use automation to train it at the user interface level. I don't have to go through all the effort to create an API and manage all that. I can do it at the user level and say, all right, do this work. And if the work's not getting done fast enough, I don't have to do anything special to a second robot. I just tell the second robot, you start right after the first one. And the two of them can do 1,440 minutes a day each. And if you say, yeah, but I got millions of backlogs, then let's just put 300, as the state of New York did during the middle of COVID for their unemployment claims. When they finally built in about two weeks of a UiPath automation, they took three days over a weekend to clear their entire backlog because we threw a 300 bots on. We only wrote one set of instructions, which was essentially go into a queue and take the first thing in the queue. We didn't have to give any kind of great algorithm, just take the first file in the queue. And as the bots lined up, they took the first one and went off and did their work. So a ton of opportunities. The other thing from if I were a CIO and I was tired of getting banged on about, hey, you, you guys aren't getting enough done. I would use RPA as a band-aid. I would put it on some of the things that I know I can't migrate for the next four to six years. Well, four to six years is a big band-aid. But it could sweep, sweep, you know, make it a little better, a little quicker, let it react a little faster and work at night when it didn't work before while you were up migrating the ones that you could do. It's almost like credit cards. Do you pay off your biggest credit card first or do you pay off your lowest balance and then put that money towards the biggest? So it doesn't really matter to me how you use the automation. It's the fact that you band-aid it for a couple of things so that they run a little bit better while you're up there fixing the things you know you can fix quickly. And so you as a CIO get to say, are those three running better? Yeah, they're running better. Well, I haven't migrated them yet, but I migrated these other two systems. And, and suddenly you are a very proactive CIO and you're getting things done during your tenure. Because as we said earlier, the, the regulations change all the time. CIOs change all the time in government. How about starting something and finishing something while you're there? Very true, sir. Why RPA for the public sector right here? Well, uh, I, I know. Uh, regarding why, why not? Partial automation is better than no automation whatsoever. <laughs> You're still going to get gains. Partial automation can be enhanced at a later date to get majority automated. So there's a lot of things that we can do. Jim's mentioned the silver tsunami. Uh, each employee at an agency can leverage UiPath technologies. It's not just the concept of let's build a centralized development group and only have them build things. You can enable studio de or, uh, citizen developers through Studio X for the business users. That way, everyone in an enterprise or an agency has the ability to automate. Uh, then, of course, RPA supports the goal of the America AI initiative that uh, Jim was talking about earlier with the OMB memos. Um, sizable ROIs we've already seen across many government agencies. 
we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of man hours saved. Think of every government agency that uses a paper form. Another thing about that is why? Because governments are moving towards technology-driven solutions like FEMA's app or different apps that the agencies offer that offer citizen services through the apps. Behind the scenes, after they fill out that form and click submit, that's automation processing those requests and orders. So Jim, tell us about public se sector early adopters. You mentioned NASA. Tell us about the GSA and how they've helped create the uh, federal RPA playbook. Yeah, so uh, Brett, I'm right there with you. On your why earlier, you know, I, I loved the other day, I was listening to the Veterans Administration, you know, the, the hospital system for military veterans. And they said, you know, we have done a journey map for our customer experience of veterans. And then she said, and we just completed our first ever employee map. And they're starting to say, the answer to why automate is not only customer experience, it's employee experience. And GSA is a great example of that. As I mentioned, GSA heard NASA CFO do a presentation. The CFO went back to his office and said, within 100 days, I want RPA in my organization. And his staff was like, well, that's not possible. And he said, wait a minute, all the RPA vendors say it's faster, it's cheaper, it's better. If it can't be done in 100 days, then we're not going to mess with it because they're not right. And the staff got it stood up in 103 days. They retrained employees of his workforce during that 100 days, took about nine days to get them through all the courses. And the RPA development staff at the GSA today is retrained and reskilled CFO employees. And I want you to really appreciate that, right? This is not CFO employees who work for IT. Mm -hmm. This is not your HRIT workforce. This is not your CIO's workforce. Now, the first thing I'll tell you is, if you don't have your CIO completely in your hip pocket with RPA, you fail. So just, you can write that down. If we were in a classroom, I'd stomp my feet for the test question. If you don't have your CIO giving you hardware, software, security, cybersecurity, in a network, you will not be successful. But the building of automations does not have to be a CIO function. And if your CIO is already busy, I would suggest you don't want to ask them to take on what now is 80 different automations in the O&M that they have at GSA. Let that retrained, reskilled workforce do that. Now, notice I'm saying it's about eight or nine employees from the uh, General Services Administration. So I don't want you to confuse a citizen developer that's not in the CIO's office with the idea of every employee having a robot. Okay? The citizen developer could be eight people that service 18,000 people at GSA. The automation goal they have at GSA is four automations a month. And if it doesn't save 2,000 hours in the business model, they won't do the automation right now because they want to make sure that it's impactful enough that their return on investment is there every time they build an automation. Think of that. So they're tracking the progress they're going to make, the savings they're going to make before they even consider development. That's great. Exactly. And, and look, uh, USDA, next on that list. Uh, last year, or in 2019, the the federal CIO, Suzette Kent, said, you know, we really want to focus on reskilling and retraining. She was able to get the staff there at the USDA to sponsor two 25-person trainings to develop and reskill their employees to do automation. If you're really interested this evening, go to a website. It's really simple. It's usda.gov slash RPA. And this is where I make my argument about that RPA is so different from anything else. The USDA on its own is publishing a customer-facing, citizen-facing website touting their robotics automation program because it's so successful. You know, that the maintenance is not as high as they're used to, the ability for their staff to build the automations, the acceptance by the employees of automations. You know, all of the things that are touted are happening in USDA has is, is just jumped on board and published theirs. A couple of weeks ago, the chief procurement officer at the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service that does all of our tax collections uh, and, that, and that kind of thing, 
she published out on her webpage a whole article on the, the hours being saved. Listen to this story. Congress directed in the National Defense Authorization Act that every government agency update every contract that was active with the phrase in there specifically about cybersecurity. The chief procurement officer at the IRS and her staff did some calculations and assumed that it would take them just at a year to go into work Microsoft Word and enter that paragraph into each one of these contracts. After two weeks of building their automation for their RPA, in three work days for the bot to do the work, in three total weeks from start to finish, her task was complete. And she was able to report out that all contracts at the IRS had this phrase in there for the direction of the National Defense Authorization Act. I got stumped just trying to figure out why IRS got tasked through the National Defense Act. That's apparently common. But the idea that they had an automation first mindset that said, hey, we could take 52 weeks to do this with all of us. But how do we automate first? And as a result, they built an automation. They built an automation. Get, get that. It wasn't that they brought in somebody real quick to do it. They had been trained to build automations and they've saved that. What would you do if you had a procurement office that had an extra 50 or 47 weeks next year? You could get more procurement done and not more administrative copying and pasting done. Um, Great. Yeah. You know, I think as humans, we're worth much more than just copy and paste. There you go. There you go. So, Brett, we've got examples of, of California DMV, the the um, uh, the DMV folks that were able to. Oh, great. You got it. I'm sorry. So we've got the DMV that during the middle of COVID realized that people still needed to have license and, and access to the um, driver's license and all those kind of things. And they've essentially created an entire virtual workforce and said, hey, their employers are happy with this. The citizens are thrilled. Right. I mean, the, it, it's it's not that everything COVID for government was a medical crisis. It was a work services to citizen crisis, right? What's that, the next example of case study there, Brett? Snap. Yeah, the SNAP program. Yeah. yeah, for those of you that don't understand SNAP, it's the government's um, state run, 50 state run, food stamps, food assistance program. Now, so if, if somebody makes a mistake, somebody doesn't eat? It, exactly. And, and what could that mistake be? They, with an automation first mindset, said, we've got people coming in the door now and, and we're overwhelmed. And we've got people in the back office that are approving renewals. Let's automate the renewal process so that people who are eating will continue to eat. And let's take our people and move them up to the front to help them ensure that people who may not eat get it done right the first time and their family's not in jeopardy because nobody knew in March and April and May exactly how bad COVID was and how long it would be around. So being able to say, we got you, we're the government, we actually are here to help is a great phrase when it's true. Now let's think of the logic behind that. With an 84% increase in efficiency for that process, there is no backlog, that's gone, that's easy. And then my issue with, wait, somebody makes a mistake, it doesn't get processed. No, we can't have that. Human error rates have dropped to zero. Yep. How's that possible? I love that. Tell us more about, uh, oh, managing infection accounts. <laughs> yeah, so we now we did see tons of activity in Health and Human Services, the National Institutes of Health, um, uh, FDA, all of those agencies really did see COVID and say, we have to, to grow ourselves out of this with technology. The, the people that normally would help them surge were all at home. And to be able to track the spread, spread of viruses, to, to be able to, I mean, simple things like map virus information with building information, you know, to help another agency understand what, you know, what was going on for that agency. You know, to be able to track the uh, uh, CMS, right, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, were using the bot to go look at their server logs, figure out who was logging in and who wasn't. Not because they knew that everybody should log in every day. That wasn't the goal. The goal was if you didn't log in for a couple of days on your computer, 
you might have a medical issue. Let's alert your supervisor to make a phone call to check on people. You know, I mean, the work we can make up, backlog at the end of the day, it can be backlog and reduced. But people, you, you got to care about them the entire time that you're a manager or a supervisor, or they'll find somebody else to be their manager or supervisor. Yeah. Another good thing about it is we've built this here now. Automation's reusable. It's scalable, meaning next time something like this happens, we're already prepared. We update the bot and run it, and it does the same thing in the future as well. So scalability is amazing with RPA. Yeah. This one, it's, it's one of ours from Jolt. We were able to work with a very large social media company. And what we were able to do was take thousands of entries in files and validate the data. Again, not a human sitting there looking, going, yep, that's a seven. Nope, that's a question mark. It was all done with, with machine logic and RPA. Then if we found something that wasn't correct, we converted it over to what we knew that was correct based on rules and validation logic that I'm going to show you in a demo that we have coming up. But as we moved forward, it wasn't just one automation that was needed. It was a suite of automation working together. We were able to work within uh, Oracle Fusion apps and the Oracle EBS, and we were able to help automate general ledger and balance spot checking through a dispatcher, performer, and a reporter robot. Again, thinking about it like humans, we dispatch for data, we perform functions with that data to get an output, and then make decisions based on that output or report. So mimicking human function, saving, uh, 1160 FTE hours over a two-week period, 26 weeks, uh, 26 bi-weekly periods per year, 53 weeks, that's almost 30,000 man hours saved per year. Not too shabby. Now, we did this all in eight weeks. We had it ready and we had it running for their production run, saving them 120K a year. Jim? Yeah, and Brett, let me, let me, one thing before you go to your demo, go back to that slide. I would like for all of you to really appreciate it. It's not necessarily in government, the 120,000, yeah. right? It's the, the fact that you can count on that service now. It's the fact that that compliance issue that you never could quite track is done. It's that extra capacity that yesterday you had eight employees that did one thing for you. And now that after eight weeks, Jolt automated half of that work. Suddenly your eight people work as if they were 16 people. You don't need new computers. You don't need new network connectivity. It's the same eight people, but they can get the work done of 16. And so the value of RPA or, or there's a lot of stuff to government that doesn't necessarily equate to, oh, we say $3 million. Right. Make it equate to it. But as a citizen, I kind of know you're going to spend $3 million. But when you do, I want world-class service in a digital age. I want my Uber. I want my um, ability to change my bank and deposit my checks. I want all the stuff I get at home. So don't be afraid of digitization, government. Give it to me and give it to me in buckets. Yeah, transformation's good. Yeah. yeah. Going to touch on this after this demo. I'm going to show you a general use case, how we go about uh, using a certificate of insurance form, a paper-based form, gathering information from it, but it's not me. It's going to be Josiah Couch, one of the senior developers here at Jolt. Hello, my name is Josiah Couch. I am a solutions architect at Jolt, and today I'll be doing a demo of automated forms validation with RPA. In this instance, we will use the validation of corporate insurance certificates as the example for this use case. First, let's take a look at the manual process. In our example of validating insurance certificates, client organizations require new vendors to provide insurance certificates to validate that their coverage limits and policies meet the minimum standards. An employee will receive the certificates of liability insurance from vendors and manually review that all the required fields in the form are filled out correctly. The employee will then use that information from the form to verify the vendor's credit rating on an external credit rating agency website and then mark this vendor's requirement as valid. To automate this process, we will use UiPath's RPA and OCR solutions to run through the whole process without human intervention. For this demo, we'll be using UiPath's read PDF activity as the first phase and 
And to make sure that the data was gathered accurately, you will do a second pass with an OCR engine. The bot will then extract the key data fields needed to complete an Excel spreadsheet report and enter the validation results. As a final step, the bot will be emailing the validation results report along with the insurance certificate to alert the employee that the vendor's form meets all the client organization's standards. Okay, bear with me. I'm gonna, <laughs> I wanted to talk over that. Hang on, let me get to where we were at. Uh, what I wanted to do is review exactly what we are. So apologies for that. Let me fast forward somehow. Help. All right. I will just let it play. Insurance certificates. Client organizations require new vendors apologies. to provide insurance certificates to validate that their coverage limits and policies meet the minimum standards. An employee will receive the certificates of the vendor's credit rating on an We will use UiPath RBA go. so that the data was gathered accurately. Final step. The bot will be emailed the iceberg. When okay, it comes to the back where we were. What you will see is the bare minimum of what RPA can do. We can have it do a lot more, such as uploading the files and results to a portal, analyzing and comparing the results, re-verifying vendor qualifications periodically, and so much more. Now that you understand how the manual process is done and how the bot works, it's time to see it in action. For demo purposes, I'll be running the automation in debug mode, which is much slower than the speed of the bot production. The first thing the bot's going to do is prepare its environment by loading the config, making sure all of the browser windows are closed and all other uh, text documents are closed. It'll also be creating the template files needed for the report. Once that's done, it will begin reading the PDF document with both the read PDF text activity and the read PDF with OCR. So what you're seeing on the screen is not a human moving the mouse, not a human switching. That's an automation doing the work. The final stage is to validate that the signature block is present. Now that the bot has finished reading the PDF document, it's going to load that information into memory in preparation for the next stage, which is validating the NAIC numbers. The bot's now going to verify the NAIC numbers of the insurers that are listed in the document and check their credit rating. Think of this company with 100,000 vendors having to do this across multiple COIs with all of the changes in insurances and NAP codes along the way. And remember, COIs can be validated now 24 hours a day. Now that the bot has finished gathering all the required information for the report, it's time to start writing the data. Notice that it's writing to Excel now for the demonstration, and again, but of course, this can be pushed step to step, much an application. Than in production. Josiah said we run it slow in demos, but just for demo purposes, we can push the data where it needs to be pushed. The next step is to write in the validations. Now we do logic checking. We can put rules that test different cases. And finally, generate the report. Now it's time to send an email. Now the bot has completed. I have a brand new data summary email. You can see here, we've got both the original COI as well as the updated COI summary and data fields. And that concludes our demo of automated forms validation with RPA. Thank you all. That's the demo. So in that, you saw us reading the certificate of insurance, gathering data from it, comparing that data against known good values, creating a delta, creating a true or a false, even looking for imagery such as signatures within that form, just like a human would do it. Gathering that information, swivel chairing over somewhere and entering it, whether it be Excel, SAP, Oracle, or whatever, it's just pushed to it all through automation, and you can continually enhance what it looks for, 
with an unlimited number of rules to compare. So how do we get started, right? Uh, for us, we identify automation candidates first. We have to know what we need to automate and, uh, and, and how we should automate it. We look for consistency. We look for where resource burden occurs, where you've got bottlenecks, very transactional details in nature within the process. Step one, step two, step three, if, then, and, or else. Uh, and then of course, where there's pain points or poor human performance. Uh, human is as human does. We are only human. Uh, that tells us about some of the pain points that we would see where RPA could supplement. But then again, it's the plan for automation and the program that drives automation within an enterprise that achieves true ROI. The building blocks for that ROI are the automation that gets deployed. So while we plan for automation, we've also got to determine is the client or deployment area mature and ready for it. If communication isn't in place to share what's being automated, the value of it and to secure the needs necessary, as Jim mentioned, CIO needs to be on board. That way we have what we do so we can move fast. But maturity and readiness are critical factors in guaranteeing success for any automation deployment. But again, we're also reliant on data. We're reliant on human interaction and SMEs. But the time that we need from an SME to explain a process or explain a system is minimal compared to the value that you get downstream. Now, the way we do it is through an automation operating model. Once we do that assessment, determine what needs to be built for second and third, that pipeline is created, hopefully with stack ranked estimated savings or projected benefits for RPA. We then deploy it, we develop it, we design it, well, we scope, design, develop, test, QA, deploy, and then manage. We want to make sure that it is deployed expertly based on UiPath recommended best practices. Agency as well as client considerations can, of course, be taken into effect and added into it. Uh, from that development process, we deploy it to production, but the job is not over. We found that we can create 10 automations, and that's good. And if we use that same team to build Automation 11, we've now got to take the time necessary to continually enhance automations one through 10. You can't just deploy it in January and see you next Thursday or see you next November. It's just like a child. It needs to be nurtured. Your automation needs to be enhanced over time. Your processes don't stay the same. Your resources don't stay the same. As you hire someone in, you train them and hope within the first 90 days it's doing its job. They're doing their job, the bot. The bot's the same way. We build it. And in 90 days, we say, are you okay? What can you do better? What can we enable you to go faster? What can we do to shrink? And we learn as the bot progresses. That's what we offer through RPA Managed Services, Robotics Operations Center, some call it. For us, it's just an aftercare program where automation is continually monitored. It's supported. If something doesn't go right with the transaction or the automation or the environment changes, we're watching. We make the enhancement that's necessary. We fix what went wrong and we evolve the bot as the business evolves as well. So we can then cyclically continue to perform that assessment and on and on until you've got a pipeline. Now at Jolt, we bring RPA delivery experience. For us, uh, some stories of success that we've seen deployed 392 bots in four months with nine resources. This is done with the concept of velocity. Stack rank and move complex work up front so you can build velocity and learn over time, building intimacy with the client in an agile manner. That's hyper automation at scale. And then of course, we like to think of the, the smaller things, the month end, the quarter end. If you can save time and it benefits your organization, do that. But like I mentioned, it's maturity and readiness that you're looking for to get started correctly. That's that transformational roadmap. We can help you map the ROI into a roadmap for you. And we don't only just automate for clients, we also automate ourselves with an internal center of excellence that drives nonstop man hours offset. So really, it's about taking the next step. So if you wanna learn more about RPA, please reach out to either Jim or myself. We're both on LinkedIn. You'll all receive a copy of this presentation in PDF after. Uh, you can always email me at jolt, info at joltag, 
We can do demos for you. We can show you more stuff. We can give you the framework for an assessment. We can talk about where you've seen RPA or where else you think it could be beneficial. And then of course, we've got ongoing webinars and educational content where you'll see gentlemen like Jim Walker and others join us. So with that, Hannah, do you wanna to move to Q&A? It looks like we have five minutes left. Yes, we will move to Q&A right now. So if you have questions for Mr. Frazier or Mr. Walker, please comment in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, the first question we have is, how do you address the change management and the adoption of RPA? Is it seamless or are there problems? Yeah, so I'm going to jump on that one, a short answer. Of course, there's problems. And don't let anybody tell you they're not. But they're no different from any other technology problems you have. If you do poor coding, if you send things to places and data stores that they're not supposed to, if you don't use security credentialing, if you don't make sure that roles-based access are enforced, you'll have bad issues with the employee or the virtual employee that is the bot. But what we're finding is, um, despite this term broken bot syndrome in the agencies we're working in, they're spending a lot more time talking about their successes than they are their problems because they are trying to stand up a community of practice and a center of excellence that does this right to start with. Yeah, for change management, if it's, if it's IT related, we can easily adapt into a change advisory board process or procedure. We can even do deltas, an automation that checks, are you currently con, uh, configured as the most up to date? If not, let us gather the white papers, let us gather the information and send it and distribute it and wait on the change advisory board for the approvals. If it's software dev, it fits into an agile framework and it's very easy to integrate into the existing change controls. So a necessary evil, absolutely. Automation can ease it, but as Jim mentioned, there's always problems. It's change. Change is hard. And another question we have is, please crystal ball your mind's eye iteration of personalized education right now, 5, 10, and 15 years from today. Yeah. I work with an advisory council out of the National Science Foundation to map education criteria for the next two generations. 10 years ago, we were talking a lot about hardware-based needs. Now, RPA developer, data scientist, that's, that's the key. That's what's going to drive the future because that's what's going to be endemic across all technologies and, and seems all business units, if, if I have my way. But for a crystal ball, it's more of an evolution of exactly what we see today. Because where were we 10 years ago? Adopting RPA. Now we're accelerating it. How are we going to begin coupling additional technologies to expand RPA's vision, voice, footprint? I think that's where we're going to go. Now, Jim, 5, 10, 15, what do you think? You know the screen here. Yeah, so let's just use Hannah here as our training partner. Hannah, when I was um, 5 or 10 years old, you actually got up off the couch and turned a knob on a television for it to change. and we have what was called a party line on a phone. So every house, of course, had a phone that was wired to the kitchen wall. And when it rang, all eight houses on the street picked up the phone, hoping the call was for them. Never did we imagine that we would, as Brett did, walk around with our phone, right? And that I would have a work phone and a play phone. And that if I wanted to watch TV, I didn't have to go turn a knob. I just put it on my phone. So I would suggest to you that the thing to be is a lifelong learner. The minute you get your first degree, what's your next degree? The minute you stop reading a magazine, what's the next magazine you're going to read? Online or on paper or on your Kindle. But the only way to keep up with the accelerated rates of change that we see in the world today is to be a lifelong learner. And then you will be ready for anybody that gets into RPA today is going to poise themselves to be ready for machine learning tomorrow. What a great deal. But my goodness, what are they going to come up with in 10 years that replaces machine learning? We don't know yet. <laughs> so Hannah, just be happy. You could just tell your phone, Alexa, order me the pizza and change the channel. We couldn't do that. We had it bad as kids. I'm not sure about that. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> you said her name. <laughs> there you go. 
All right, well, it looks like that is all the time that we have for this evening. Um, I'd like to thank you both for sharing your knowledge of RPA with our audience. Um, if you would like more information or have further questions about today's event, please make sure to visit the links that were provided in the chat box below or reach out to Mr. Frazier, Mr. Walker, as they said. Um, also, if you are interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Walker and Mr. Frazier for joining us this evening and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and Facebook. Um, so thank you both. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thanks again.